3,000 years ago, in what is modern-day Lebanon, lived one of the most sophisticated people of the ancient world, the Phoenicians. At its height, the Phoenician Empire rivaled the great civilizations of ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome. But is there a dark side to this enigmatic people? Many archaeologists and historians believe they also sacrificed their own children in horrifying religious rituals. We have this uh, massive, uh, very dramatic rite taking place in the dark, involving the cutting of, of the throat and bloodletting, accompanied by musicians. The Phoenicians had a sacrificer, someone who was especially adept with the knife and could slit the throats very effectively. A blood sacrifice on the altar, accompanied by the actual cremation on a funeral pyre. Did these blood-curdling rituals actually take place? Other scholars dismiss the stories as an ancient smear campaign. In reality, child sacrifice never existed. It's a tale invented by the many detractors that the Phoenician civilization has had during the centuries. Starting from the Greeks, then the Romans, all the way up to the 20th century. In realtà, il sacrificio probabilmente non è mai esistito. Three months ago, a group of world-renowned scientists traveled to a small island off the coast of Sicily on a special mission. 6,000 funeral urns have been discovered here, containing the charred remains of cremated Phoenician children. Are these the bones of infants who were sacrificed, or are they merely the cremated remains of children who died of natural causes? By subjecting the remains to cutting-edge forensic analysis and DNA testing, it may finally be possible to discover the truth about this extraordinary people. Called the Canaanites in the Bible, the Phoenicians established a vast maritime empire, sailing all over the Mediterranean, trading gold and silver, olive oil and fine wine. Phoenician settlements have been discovered in Sicily, Spain and Cyprus. But Carthage in modern-day Tunisia was the jewel of the Phoenician commercial empire. The city boasted vast libraries, temples and law courts. Carthaginians lived in huge blocks of flats, six stories high. The ruins of this great city, which once rivaled ancient Rome, have been discovered on the Bursa Hill outside Tunis. American historian Glenn Marco was commissioned by the British Museum to write the first major study on the Phoenicians for 30 years. The city was an extraordinary architectural wonder, and it would be amazing to be here at Carthage uh, two centuries before Christ, to see this incredible residential complex of six-story buildings uh, looming up into the sky, be being dwarfed by these structures as you walk up the streets of, uh, of the city. We're at the basement level of one of these massive six-story apartment complexes that the Carthaginians built on the Birsa slope. We know this because of the extraordinary thickness of the exterior walls of this building and the sheer capacity of these massive underground cisterns, more than 20 cubic meters, that served uh, an enormous number of people. These water cisterns served up to 60 people living in each apartment block. Remains show that each home had its own tiled kitchen and bathroom. But Carthage was to become a victim of its own success. Jealous of their commercial empire, first the Greeks, then the Romans waged war on the Phoenicians. In 264 BC, Rome launched the first of a series of military campaigns against the Carthaginians, known as the Punic Wars. For over a century, the Phoenicians resisted Rome, and the name of their leader is still associated with power and strength. The one Phoenician personality known to us today is Hannibal. 
great general of the Second Punic War, that crossed the Alps with a troop of, of soldiers mounted on elephants and nearly brought the city of Rome to its knees. Had he done so, the whole history of the Western world as we know it today would have been rewritten by the Carthaginians rather than the Romans. But barely 40 years after Hannibal's death, Romans torched and destroyed Carthage. Contemporary accounts graphically illustrate the bloody and bitter final struggle. Some were stabbed, others were hurled alive from the roofs of the buildings. All places were filled with groans, shrieks, shouts and every kind of agony. Old men, women and children had hidden in the inmost nooks of the houses. Some of them were wounded, some more or less burned, all uttering horrible cries. Others, thrust out and falling from such a height with stones, timbers and fire, were torn asunder into all kinds of horrible shapes, crushed and mangled. The Romans didn't just defeat the Phoenicians in battle, they tried to obliterate all trace of their culture and traditions. The Roman destruction led to the destruction of the great library at Carthage itself, and as a result of that, we've lost all of the original documents written by the Phoenicians in their own language, describing what had actually transpired in the city in the years before uh, the Roman destruction. Out of the ashes of the Phoenician defeat rose the mighty Roman Empire, which spread through North Africa and much of Europe. This monumental amphitheatre at El Gem near Carthage towers over the Saharan desert, just as Roman accounts dominate our view of antiquity. History is written by the victorious, and virtually everything we know about the Phoenicians comes from their enemies, first the Greeks, then the Romans. They wrote of fanatical and bloody religious practices. During the height of one orgiastic rite, Phoenician men sometimes castrated themselves in an attempt to emulate their goddess Astarte. Astarte was a goddess of fertility and famous across the ancient world. Perched high on a mountain, Ereche in Sicily was once the site of a shrine to Astarte. According to the Romans, behind these walls, the Phoenicians practiced a ritual of sacred prostitution. This Norman castle was built on the site where, in Phoenician times, the vast temple to Astarte stood. Gaia Savario is the author of a book about the Phoenicians in Sicily. This is an extraordinarily mystical place. People flocked here from all over the Mediterranean. It was kind of lured. And this was a place where um, sacred prostitution took place. And the prostitutes were girls from what we would say good family, uh, offering their virginity to the goddess Astarte. According to Roman and Greek historians, it was common practice among Phoenician aristocrats to bring their virgin daughters to the temple when they reached the age of puberty. The girls had to go to the temple of Astarte and stay there and be lain with strange men. The high priest would then force them to have sex with visiting foreigners who paid the temple handsomely for the privilege. The stranger was viewed as an emissary from the gods. After intercourse, the girl had made herself holy in the sight of Astarte and went away home. So these very young girls were actual prisoners until they were deflowered. So the pretty girl could get home um, quite, quite quickly after giving up their virginity, uh, while the ugly one had to wait to be picked up. According to Greek and Roman accounts, sacred prostitution took place in Cyprus, Tunisia and Sicily. They claim the Phoenicians exported their grotesque religious practices as they sailed across the Mediterranean and beyond. But the classical writers did praise the maritime prowess of this merchant race. The Phoenicians were the first to use the stars for navigation. The Phoenicians were the first to circumnavigate Africa. They sailed from Egypt and it was not until the third year that they returned. This Phoenician ship 
the only one of its kind to be excavated, reveals their revolutionary shipbuilding technique. 3,000 years before IKEA, the Phoenicians produced prefabricated vessels, which were transported in sections across their empire. Putting sections together was aided by another new invention, the alphabet. A matched A, B to B, and so on. According to the Greeks and Romans, wherever they settled, the Phoenicians brought with them both new advances and dark practices. By far the most terrifying allegation was child sacrifice. In times of war, famine or pestilence, the Phoenicians sacrificed their own infant children. In crises of great danger, it was a custom of the Phoenicians to give freely their best-loved children in sacrifice as a ransom to the avenging demons. Those given up were slaughtered in mystic rites. The Phoenicians, it was said, sacrificed their children to appease their bloodthirsty gods. Baal Hamon and his wife, Tanit. Baal and Tanit took many forms. They could have an animal face or be human. Baal was often represented as a disc and a crescent. His wife Tanit as a triangle with outstretched arms. Some historians believe Baal was the root of the word Beelzebub, who today we associate with the devil. According to the Greek and Roman accounts, the ceremony of child sacrifice began with the parents handing over their baby to the high priest to be anointed with perfume and oils. Meanwhile, the sacrificer, an assistant priest, made preparations for the baby's death. The priest carried the baby at the head of a procession to the sacrificial altar in a sacred precinct known as a tofet. These grinning masks have been found in Phoenician sites. They were probably hung on walls to ward off evil spirits in the next world, but some experts believe they were worn by the parents to hide their grief. Even the Romans, not known for their humanity, claimed to be shocked at a religious ceremony where babies had their throats cut. They would bring to the altars children whose age evokes pity even among enemies. To think that men were so barbarous, so savage, that they gave the name sacrifice to the slaughter of their own children. Some accounts imply the dead baby's face was covered with a grinning mask before it was thrown onto the funeral pyre. When the flames fall upon the body, the limbs contract and the open mouth seems almost to be laughing. Thus it is that the grin is known as sardonic laughter. And the whole area before the statue was filled with a loud noise of flutes and drums so that the cries of the wailing should not reach the ears of the people. The blood of the child was collected and used to anoint the altar. They sometimes sprinkled children's blood upon the altars. They thus implored the favor of the gods through the blood of those sacrificed. The quantity and detail of the Greek and Roman accounts of child sacrifice meant that for hundreds of years they were generally accepted as fact. 
But in the 19th century, historians increasingly began to dismiss these ancient sources as biased and unreliable. It's a debate that has continued to this day. Professor Piero Bartoloni has spent years studying the excavations in Carthage. He's internationally recognized as a world authority on the Phoenician civilization. In reality, il sacrificio probabilmente non è mai esistito. In reality, child sacrifice never existed. It's a tale invented by the many detractors that the Phoenician civilization has had during the centuries. Starting from the Greeks, then the Romans, all the way up to the 20th century. While the, it's clear the Phoenicians were not well loved among Greek and Roman peoples, it would be very difficult to just toss aside all of these uh, citations and say they're completely tendentious and have no uh, root in uh, rooting in actual fact. The academic debate intensified when archaeologists excavating Carthage uncovered this tophet, a Phoenician sacred precinct. Underneath these standing stones, similar to gravestones, were thousands of urns containing charred remains of human infants. Many believe this could be the site where the ritual sacrifice of children actually happened. You might wonder why a sophisticated people, among the most sophisticated uh, in the Mediterranean or even the world at that time, would have indulged in such a barbaric practice of child sacrifice. And uh, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do think they did practice child sacrifice on an institutional level. To, uh, Professor Larry Stego of Harvard University led the international team that fully excavated the Carthage Tophet in the 1970s. The sheer scale of what they uncovered was extraordinary. We had maybe 20,000 over a 200 year period in ancient Carthage that we would estimate were sacrificed. That's about, oh, what is it, 100 per year at least. So, what is this place? Did parents really bring their children here to be ritually slaughtered? Or is there a more benign explanation for the Tophet? The Tophet is simply a separate place, isolated from the adult cemetery where stillborn children were buried or those who died soon after birth. It's important to remember that in ancient times, seven out of ten children died in infancy. Of the three who survived, only one would reach adulthood. So infant mortality was extremely high, and these dead children were buried in an honorable way to appease the gods and to help propitiate another birth. The Tophet is at the heart of the debate about whether the Phoenicians did or did not sacrifice their children. Is it simply a cemetery for babies who died of natural causes, or is it evidence of something much more sinister? The archaeology doesn't prove one way or another whether it was actually child sacrifice and then uh, being buried in these special burial grounds, or was it simply children dying of natural causes being cremated, placed in jars, and buried in these special precincts. Uh, it's an arguable uh, question and hasn't been resolved to everyone's uh, satisfaction, otherwise we wouldn't still be arguing about it. Back in the 1970s, forensic archaeology was in its infancy. But now, new scientific techniques may finally be able to settle the argument once and for all. What we are able to do today uh, is uh, quite a bit more than we could have done 20 years ago when analyzing what are probably the most important elements of this archaeology, namely the physical anthropology, the bones of the cremated or burnt children. 
In the last three months, scientists in Britain and Israel have been using cutting-edge forensic techniques to analyze the charred remains of the children buried in the Tophet. The race is now on for a result. Moccia, a small island off the coast of Sicily, a hundred miles north of Carthage, is the site of another Phoenician Tophet. It could hold the key to the question of whether or not child sacrifice was actually practiced by the Phoenicians. Earlier this summer, Glen Marco and a group of leading scientists headed off to Moccia to try and resolve the issue once and for all. In Phoenician times, Moccia was a city teeming with over 15,000 people. But in 397 BC, it was destroyed after an extended siege. The inhabitants were massacred and the buildings left to rot. This disaster is a huge benefit for the team. Moccia was never fully reoccupied, and so the site is not cluttered with the debris of subsequent civilizations. This site is significant, uh, first of all, because in contrast to all of the other cities that the Phoenicians occupied, which were always in such amazing locations that they were built upon by the Romans and peoples after them. Because of the remarkable condition of the site, we have uh, a number of complexes that are completely preserved. One of them is the Tophet. Like the Tophet in Carthage, archaeologists discovered a large walled precinct in Motya. They excavated 6,000 clay urns, once again filled with charred bones. The thousands of urns discovered on the island are now in storerooms under lock and key. The hope is that by investigating their contents, the scientists will reveal the secrets of the Tophet. Dr. Charlotte Roberts is a biological anthropologist. She hopes to discover remains that are sufficiently well preserved to indicate whether the children were healthy or diseased. If they're diseased, then it's likely that Tophets are ordinary cemeteries for children who died from natural causes. But if they're healthy, then perhaps they died in some unnatural way, possibly in a sacrificial rite. A normal skeleton would make her task relatively easy. But these remains were cremated 3,000 years ago. Here we've got one cremated individual, we assume. And if I just gradually tip this out on the table, you can probably understand the problems I'm faced with when it comes to doing an analysis of this sort of material. The first thing is it's really fragmented and there are lots and lots of fragments. Charlotte's first task is to confirm that the bones are indeed from infants. Um, here we've got what looks like a rib from a baby. And here I think we've got part of the mandible, the lower jaw. Here, yes, this looks like part of the skull, uh, something called the petrous part of the temporal bone. These are the ones that survive quite well in cremation. As Charlotte picks through the bones, she makes an unexpected discovery. Here's a bit of pelvis, which I think is from a sheep or a goat. Here's another animal bone, again probably from a sheep or a goat. And this big chunk is also animal bone. And there are different ways of identifying human from non-human. The outer layer of the bone here, which is called the cortex, tends to be more dense um, and, and often thicker than a human bone. Many of the Carthage urns excavated back in the 1970s also contained a mixture of animal, bird and human bones. But why? The evidence can be interpreted in totally different ways. There's no dispute that the Phoenicians sacrificed animals in the Tophet. 
So one theory is that the animals and children were sacrificed at the same ceremonies. The result was that their cremated remains got mixed up on the funeral pyre and therefore in the urns. Sometimes we get bits of the animal or bits of the human together in the same jar and it's unlikely that this is an intentional interment in the jar, but just an accident of uh, scraping off the pyre. But for other academics, it's no accident. They believed the Phoenicians deliberately sacrificed birds and animals when they cremated newborn babies who had died of natural causes. Inside the urns, mixed up with the children's bones, we also find the bones of small animals which were sacrificed during the cremation ceremony. The sacrifice of these small birds or lambs was meant to accompany the child to the other side, to the next life. This might explain the urns with mixed remains, but many of the Carthage urns only contained animal bones. In some of these jars, uh, for example, in this one, there wasn't a baby in there at all, only a lamb. So my question to those who claim that this is just an infant cemetery, uh, that is only for children who died of natural causes, why in the world then are they burying their pets? The archaeological debate goes on, but back in Motia, there's been a breakthrough that may help solve the mystery. Charlotte Roberts has found human teeth, an important indicator of general health. If they show signs of disease, then the children could have died from natural causes and not in a sacrificial rite. The teeth survive very well during burial, uh, much better than the bones, so we do get quite a lot of evidence for dental disease. Um, what we term metabolic diseases, so disorders of normal metabolism, things like anemia, rickets, vitamin D deficiency, scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. Metabolic disorders could affect dental development, so Charlotte uses the microscope to look for defects in the enamel. After careful scrutiny, she's prepared to reach some conclusions. On the basis of what I've seen, there's, there's no dental defects in these teeth from these individuals. Um, suggesting that they didn't suffer any disease or nutritional problems. In all, Charlotte looked at the remains of over 20 children. She found nothing to suggest they died of disease. And there's one piece of archaeological evidence which supports the theory that the children in the Tophet were healthy when they met their death. It's an engraving on one of the standing stones found above the urns. There's a very evocative image that actually shows a priest cradling a young infant in his arms. It's very clear that the child is alive. He's being held upright and cradled in the arm. And uh, I think this is the process that happens before the immolation of the child, before the cutting of the throat and the actual sacrifice. Glenn Marco believes the Phoenician wall surrounding Motia provides further important archaeological evidence of the special status of the Tophet. His argument is that in Phoenician times, Motia was connected to Sicily by a road. Although the road is underwater now, the lighter blue color of the lagoon reveals its position. This road made Motia vulnerable to attack from the mainland. In the 6th century BC, this defensive wall was hastily constructed around the island when the Greeks declared war. Now the, the wall itself, because it hugs the contour of the island, cut across the uh, cemetery which lies to our west. And that wall literally bisects the cemetery itself. To save time, the wall's builders took the easiest route, even though it meant cutting across the cemetery. However, when they came to the Tophet, they took the trouble to build around it. Why? The implication of this, of course, is that this was a very sacred, hallowed ground. What we have is not a cemetery for children that died from natural causes, but 
a very sacred uh, precinct of ritual child sacrifice. Glenn Marco may be right, but he admits that only unambiguous scientific evidence will prove conclusively his belief that ritual child sacrifice actually happened. I think the evidence that would really settle this debate over child sacrifice versus uh, natural burial would be the evidence of the age of the children uh, cremated. The age of the children when they died is critical because Professor Bartoloni maintains that the Tophet is simply a special cemetery for infants who died from natural causes. Nella realtà, il Tophet che cos'è? So, the Tophet, what is it? It's an open-air space where Phoenician children, either stillborn or who died soon after birth, were buried. So, how old are the children buried in the Tophet? Were most of them stillborn or newborns who died in the first critical weeks of life? The answers could lie in the teeth that Charlotte Roberts is examining. We know in modern populations how the teeth develop, when each teeth starts to develop, when it comes through the gums and sh shows in the mouth, um, and then we compare what we see in our archaeological teeth with the modern data. Even 3,000-year-old teeth can give evidence of the children's age at the time of death. Well, looking at these teeth down the microscope, we've got two people here and on the basis of the teeth, they're two to three months of age when they were cremated. None of the 20 children examined by Charlotte were stillborn or newborn. All the teeth were from infants aged between two or three months. And even more compelling evidence about the age of the children has been found in Israel. The Hebrew University in Jerusalem has a team analyzing the teeth found in Carthage. Once again, the aim is to find out the age of the babies in the urns. Last month, the preliminary results on 20 tooth samples known as tooth germs came through. So far, none of the babies were still born. And here, this is the germ. It's the first baby molar, the first deciduous molar. And this is the crown, only about half formed. This suggests that this infant was aged one to two months when it died. Other children found at Carthage were much older. And if I take out this tooth germ, this is the tooth germ of a first permanent molar. And here you can see that the crown is about two-thirds formed. That indicates that this child was about two years old when he died or was sacrificed. We have so far only looked at a small sample of the remains from Carthage, but we have found some infants that were as old as five years. None of the 40 children examined from both the Carthage and Motya Tofets were stillborn. Their ages range from two or three months to two years, and one was about five. These results undermine Professor Bartoloni's theory that the Tophet was a special cemetery for stillborns or babies who died shortly after birth. It seems that the Phoenicians probably did sacrifice their children to appease their gods. There's one further forensic test which could settle the debate once and for all, DNA analysis. But will it be possible? DNA has never been successfully extracted from the cremated remains of children who died 3,000 years ago. What sex were the babies in the Tophet? According to some of the biblical and classical accounts, it appears they were boys. He supplicated the gods after the custom of his people by sacrificing a young boy to Baal. They had been accustomed to sacrifice to this god the most noble of their sons. But some scholars have questioned the accuracy of these translations. Sometimes it refers to boys, but I think that's a generic term 
for children as, as a whole. But there's certainly no, um, no references at all to uh, young girls uh, being involved in the sacrificial process. If the babies died of natural causes, there should be an approximately equal number of boys and girls in the Tophet. But if the babies in the urns turn out to be all boys, the case for child sacrifice will be proved beyond doubt. DNA tests could provide the answer. Now with the new DNA analyses, we should be able to determine uh, whether or not it is a male or a female that is being sacrificed. And this will be of great interest, especially since at least some of the biblical details uh, and other uh, classical references at times imply that it is firstborn males that are chosen to be uh, sacrificed. If these tests show us for sure that these children are the firstborn, that they're exclusively boys, I'll eat my words. But I don't think they will. Glenn, can I give you some wine? In Motia, Glenn Marco talks to Dr. Ron Dixon and Dr. Kerry Brown. They're both internationally renowned microbiologists, and Glenn is hoping they'll be able to extract DNA from the charred bones in the urns. DNA may survive in cremated bones as long as the cremation temperatures were not too high. If you can get DNA out of these infant remains, if you find sequences from the Y chromosome, you have a male infant. If you just get DNA from the X chromosome, you've got a female infant. So I think this could be the way forward to finding out whether you've got boys or girls being uh, sacrificed, or not as the case may be. In the museum storeroom, Ron Dixon collects the samples he and Kerry will need to establish the sex of the cremated children through DNA analysis. The human bones that have best survived the cremation process are the ones most likely to contain ancient DNA. These are going to be taken back to Britain for analysis. Oh, nice bit of skull there. Now we take these extraordinary precautions gloves and masks and so on, and all the material you see is sterile because we want to protect the bones from our own DNA. We produce DNA on our skin and we could well contaminate these. And now this bag is sealed, and of course the samples are in a, in a sterile bag and they're con ready for analysis. People contain huge amounts of DNA in their bodies. And if you could unravel the DNA from the billions of cells that we normally contain, then that DNA would stretch to the sun and back 129 times. Of course, when we die, this is rapidly degraded into very small fragments, perhaps no larger than your thumbnail. Ron is pessimistic about the possibility of extracting DNA from the bones, but Kerry is more hopeful. These bones are about 3,000 years old. Uh, DNA has been isolated from bones as old as 30,000 years, um, famous case being that of a, a Neanderthal from the Caucasian mountains. So I think these bones are well within the time frame for DNA survival. Although degradation of DNA occurs very rapidly after death, after a certain amount of time it seems to stabilise and remains pretty constant. I think the problem with this material, as you can see, it's very fragmented, it's cremated, and I think that, that it really would be a long shot if we could um, get survivable DNA to do our uh, sex tests on this material. They're not insurmountable problems. We do have techniques. Um, it would be time consuming, but um, given the time and the money, it can be done, I think. Every cell in the body contains within it a two-meter strand of DNA, the genetic blueprint for producing a human being. But shortly after death, cells rapidly lose this genetic material. The DNA strands become fragmented and difficult for scientists to analyze. Bradford, last month. Ron Dixon and Kerry Brown have spent weeks struggling to extract DNA from the Motian remains. One place where tiny fragments of ancient DNA sometimes survive is in the teeth. 
but these hopes were dashed early on. The teeth were really so degraded that we were only left with the enamel shell and um, we, we know really that we're unlikely to get DNA from that sort of material. The bones are also in a much worse condition than they hoped. These bones don't seem to be very well preserved at all. They don't seem to have anything in the way of microstructure. By microstructure, I mean the little channels through the bone matrix, which carry things like blood vessels. And of course, it's from these little blood vessels that the DNA comes from. But they haven't given up yet. They're off to supervise research assistant Alex Wan, who's doing the analysis. Well, those are good ideas, but of course we've got to design the primers first. They enter the antechamber to the laboratory, where they'll have to don gloves, masks and protective glasses so that they don't contaminate the ancient samples with their own DNA. Alex is working alone in a sterile environment. She's already cut off the exterior of each bone fragment. This is to remove the DNA of anyone who has recently handled them. She now adds a solution that will react with the bones and draw out DNA. She also adds solution to an empty tube as a control. Hi Alex, how's it going? It's very important while the extraction with the bone is carried out that there's also a parallel extraction carried out. In other words, you go through exactly the same procedure but with no bone present. If that gives you a positive result, then you know there's DNA contamination getting in somewhere. For instance, from the researcher or from another person. I think we shall remove ourselves. Hey, right. See you later. See you later. Once the solution has been added to the bone, it's shaken up. The mixture is put into a water bath with a temperature of 60 degrees centigrade. This will help leach out any DNA. A centrifuge now separates the bone fragments from the solution that may contain the ancient DNA. Another pipette is used to draw off this solution. This whole process has taken 24 hours and Alex is finally left with just this tiny amount of clear liquid. To find out whether it contains any ancient DNA involves yet another lengthy process. One of the characteristics of ancient DNA is that very little of it survives. So we use what's called the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to target a particular piece of DNA. These samples are now ready for the PCR machine. This is the revolutionary part of the process that makes the analysis of ancient DNA possible. After death, the DNA strands become fragmented and difficult to analyze. The bonds linking the double helix are broken through the PCR process. Then, the single strand is cloned up to a billion times, making enough DNA for scientists to try and identify specific chromosomes. PCR is basically the ability to amplify, to magnify very, very small specific sections or, or strands of DNA. Hopefully, the PCR machine will have cloned a tiny surviving fragment of ancient DNA to produce enough for genetic analysis. To find out if this has happened, the samples have to be stained in a special gel. If there is ancient DNA, the sex will be revealed. If we had a male, we'd be looking for two bands. One would be from the X chromosome, one would be from the Y chromosome. If it was a female, we would see just one band because females have two X chromosomes. So when we look at a gel under the ultraviolet irradiation, um, hopefully we should see some bands with the ancient DNA which will tell us whether we're dealing with male or female infant remains. Alex runs an electrical current through the gel which will develop the ancient DNA, if there is any. So far she's tried 12 times, unsuccessfully. For Alex it has been a real struggle. 
with the, the extractions and the PCR, running the gels to get results from these bones. So if she has succeeded in getting um, any results from these bones, it's, I think that's a, a heroic effort on her part. Each attempt to extract ancient DNA takes three days. After 12 failures, Kerry and Ron are hoping attempt number 13 will be lucky. It isn't. We can now know, perhaps, that we really can't find DNA that will survive a cremation within, in, this type of, um, in this type of bone. But Alex persuades Ron and Kerry to let her have another go. While she repeats the process in Bradford, in Jerusalem they have made a breakthrough. Pat Smith has managed to extract tiny ancient DNA fragments from the Carthage babies. We do have some preliminary results. They show two bands. Two bands equals a boy, one band equals a girl. So it seems that at least the specimens we've looked at, we have boys. Obviously we need to look at a very much larger sample before we can say definitely that the probability of girls being buried there was extremely low. If the babies in the urns found in the Motia Tofet all turn out to be boys, then science will have finally proved beyond doubt that the Tofets were sites of ritual child sacrifice. Back in Bradford, Alex is about to find out whether she's finally found ancient DNA and what sex it is. She summoned Ron and Kerry for the moment of truth. Hi. Hi. I think you should come and look at this. You got something? Well, have a look and see. All right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Along with the ancient DNA, the gel also contains modern DNA from a man and a woman as a point of comparison. Yes, you've got the male, two bands from modern DNA. That's the female, modern DNA, one band. And that's the ancient DNA, and we see one band there, so... That's marvellous, and it's a girl! <laughs> so that's great! That's our, well, so it's a the real, blanks have been blank here. It's a real result. Great. Well done. But it's a very disappointing result for the advocates of the child sacrifice theory. I don't want to make too much of uh, that evidence until it's been uh, further studied and we continue to do more work on these bones because we're learning much more, uh, even though it's now uh, several decades since we uh, did our excavations in Carthage. The Israeli team are now embarking on a massive study. Over the next five years, they hope to conduct DNA tests on hundreds of Carthage infants. If they find a fairly even mix of both boys and girls, Professor Bartoloni will be proved right and the Roman and Greek accounts of child sacrifice would be fiction. But the advocates of the child sacrifice theory are pinning their hopes on finding a disproportionate number of either girls or boys. If we have a great predominance of young girls, this would, would fit in with the bias that we might have in the ancient world of young girls being undervalued by society so that it would be easier and less painful for the family to sacrifice a girl than a boy. If the predominance are boys, then this would fit in with the notion of the supreme sacrifice of the uh, young firstborn male. The absence of disease in the teeth and the age of the children analyzed so far suggested that child sacrifice did indeed occur. But the discovery of a female child has thrown these findings into confusion. It may take several more years for science to finally discover whether there was children's blood on the altar. <laughs>